Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's edition of HR Mentorship Learning Series. Tonight, it's my privilege and pleasure to be the facilitator, and I will be taking us on a short course of titled Key HR Models or Frameworks and Applications to Organizational Challenges, Opportunities, or Applications to Organizational Issues. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in my journey as an HR professional, both from the practitioner's perspective and also the academic perspective, I've come to realize, ladies and gentlemen, that there are certain solutions or buckets of solutions that have been created. All we need to do is to adopt them. Of course, in adopting, it may not be a literal copy and paste, but we can use it to broaden our thought process, broaden our perspective, ensure we leave no stone on top, also ensure that we have a holistic, a comprehensive, a robust perspective to, to issues. Now, some of you also agree that if we have done one thing or the other before, consultants, okay, you know, for example, the top four, if you know the top four, you can drop it in the chat box. Top four or any major consulting firm, you engage with them. I've had the privilege, for example, of engaging as a client with all the members of the top four and even other top tier consulting firms that are not in the top four. One thing that I can confirm based on my engagement with them is that they use a lot of frameworks. They use a lot of models. They use a lot of templates. Some of these templates, they probably cre created it on their own. They fine tune. Some too is, um, they, they maybe extended, abstracted, you know, rejected an existing model, maybe based on the local context, the industry context, the peculiarity of the setting or and situation, as the case may be. Again, I've also had the privilege of working in various organizations with various organizational leaders. One of the things some of these people look out for is not just the solution. They look out for how the solution was arrived at. Now, I've done a couple of webinars for HR mentorship and, of course, for other organizations and institutions. Now, one of the most successful webinars I've done, if I remember clearly, the topic of that title is how to ace your case, HR case study. Now, in that, you can check it out on my YouTube channel, Liam Adioshu, how to ace your case, your HR case study. In other words, if you are an interview, a part of the interview process is an assessment to for a case study to test your practical hands-on knowledge on HR. And I choose in that teaching quite a number of frameworks. Because when you use a framework, you are going to cover all the sites. Now, models are based on theoretical principles. When I say theoretical, there are so many sources of these theories. Some are from human resource management directly. Some are from sociology. Some are from psychology, some are from business administration, some are from management, okay? Some are even from law, okay? So these frameworks are sourced from different academic areas and empirical research. Okay, they provide valuable insights into human behavior, organizational dynamics, and strategic HR management. So by leveraging on HR models, Organization can make informed decisions, implement best practices, and achieve their goals while maximizing the potential of their human capital, their employees, their staff. Better models encompass a wide range of concepts and approaches, even focusing on different aspects of HR management. So as an HR executive, manager, professional, director, okay, it is very good you are acquainted with these theories, are not just acquainted with them that we use them. You know, some of us, we did um, CIPF. Some of these models were part of what we learned. 
But the challenge is after we pass the CIPM exam, we stop referencing those models. Some of us even took it one or two steps further. We have a HRCI certifications, we have SHRM certifications embedded in these professional courses, both local and foreign, are models. Again, we read them, we understood them, we passed the exams, then we fell stop short of applying them or attempting to apply them on our day-to-day task, on our strategic task. Learning the theories and models allows you to even experiment. You can customize, okay? It, and then you'll be able to determine when you have a situation at hand, if you scan through some of these models, you don't need to use everything. You may use just one or two at most, and you'll be able to come up with a solution. Now, the HR model or framework is a term that refers to organization strategic plan. Now, I've seen some of my friends, colleagues, you will see their signature in their email. They will say strategic HR management, and I love that. I've also seen some MDs, some CEOs, they will say to their HR sometimes that, oh, you need to be more strategic, or you are not strategic at all. Frameworks and models ensure that you are strategic. Once you use the appropriate model or framework per time, there is no way to use a framework and you will not be strategic. Because framework, okay, refers to the organization's strategic plan in the very first place for managing and coordinating human resources or human capital-related functions to achieve organizational objectives. So the goal of developing HR model is to assist the business in managing their workforce very efficiently, effectively, and then very importantly, to achieve organizational goals. Again, the HR model can also be a conceptual representation of how an HR department functions. So in different organizations, some have what we call HRVPs, human resource business partners, and then they have what we call a center of excellence. Some will just have maybe one or two HR people that will just be HR generalists. Those in themselves are also types of models. So there are models that guide how we even structure the departments as it were. And the model can be a function of the industry we play in, the overall number of staff, the stage of the organization. For example, an organization that is a startup is different from an organization that is mature, that has been in existence for 10, 20, 30 years. HR models are used to map out the workings of the human resource management department. And it doesn't matter whether you are starting from the scratch or you are trying to pivot your organization, you are trying to rejig, you are trying to navigate a, a crisis situation, or you are trying to navigate a new opportunity or, or expansion. Having built that foundation, okay, because a model is a structure that must also rest on a, on, on a foundation. So having provided that background, we'll now be looking at some of the models. Just to mention again, we are not looking at all the models. We'll just look at some of the models. If opportunity, if required, we can also do a part of this session and take some additional model. The first model we are going to be looking at is called Harvard HR Management Model. Harvard HR Management Model. And we'll come back to this diagram. But first and foremost, let's just take a holistic view of it, okay? So the Harvard model is attributed to Michael Beer around 1984. And of course, there are contributions from other scholars and researchers and practitioners like Paul and Richardson. Now, the model comprises of five components. The model comprises of five components. These are the five components here. Stakeholder interest, situational factors, HR, policy choices, HR outcomes, long-term consequence. Now, let's look at it from here. Then we go back to the, the, the diagram, okay, to the image. So it starts with what? Stakeholder interest. The stakeholders include shareholders. That's the owners of the business. Typically, they will be represented by a board. It, stakeholders include the management. 
employee groups, for example, union or workers' council, the government, it could even include your customers, your clients, the other organizations within the industry, and so on and so forth. These interests help define HR policies. So in other words, when you are trying to do anything in HR or for HR, you need to identify all these stakeholders and consider rigorously their perspective, their influence, their stake, and their interest as you come up with the policy. So imagine you come up with a program and you did not bother to even identify the stakeholders, or you assumed that your stakeholder is just the employee, or only the employee and the management. You may meet a brick wall in front. You may get suboptimal results in front. But because you are using a model, and that model, for example, has specified stakeholder and has listed an array of stakeholders, and you have exhaustively itemized them and thought about the impact of your program or policy on the stakeholders, how they can be of support or hindrance to your policy or program, you will see that you will put forward a more robust case, business case, a more robust program, a more robust concept. Again, there are situational factors that influence this interest. Situational factors include workforce characteristics, unions, and other factors that are part of this. Situational factors and stakeholder interests also influence human resource management policies. They include the core HR activities, such as recruitment, okay, training, and reward systems. When done well, human resource management policies lead to what? Excuse me a positive human resource management outcomes. Now, you will see that I've highlighted some words on this slide. Human resource management policy, the human resource management outcomes. Okay, so this includes retention. So we are talking now about outcomes. So anytime you are coming up with a document, a proposal, a, a business case, you are not just thinking about the policy, you are also thinking concurrently about the outcomes. So that you will not mention the policy without mentioning the outcomes. If the outcome is not robust, you yourself will step it down. You are not going to take it to the management for consideration or for, for approval, okay? And the outcomes can include retention. Outcomes can include cost effectiveness. Outcomes can include commitment. Outcomes can include what? Competence. So these positive HR outcomes lead to long-term consequence. This can be what? Individual for the employees, organization for the business, the business owners, and societal. The Harvard model of human resource management focusing on human resources, okay, rather than just outcomes, it implies that continually looking for better methods to utilize people will lead to what? Profitability. The model balances employees, operations, and management by offering a framework. Now, let's spend one or two minutes to look at the model again. We've discussed it in brief, but let's just take a few minutes to look at it again. So, this is like a recap now of the model. So, please look at your screen, look at your phone, look at your system, whatever device you are joining this session from, there are five major components of this model. We have stakeholder interests, and you can see these are the stakeholders. Then you have situational factors, workforce characteristics, a business strategy and condition, management philosophy. In other words, how your ownership thinks Okay. Some of the things that influence this management philosophy, for example, if it's a multinational, there are certain philosophies associated with them. If it is a one-man business, there are also certain philosophies as associated with it. If the owners are capitalists in orientation or socialists in, in orientation, they are philosophies. You also have the labor markets. You have excess supplies of talent or shortage 
of challenge or excess in some roles, shortage in some roles? What kind of genius play? in your sector? What is the kind of relationship and rapport you built with the unions? What are the technology available, accessible to you, to your, to your organization? Then what does the law say, the labor law and other subsidiary laws? Then what are the societal values? Because if you are working in Nigeria, it's slightly different from when you are working in Ghana. Generally speaking, from a Nigerian point of view, I used to work. I used to work with an organization where we had branches in Nigeria and, and Ghana. Anytime our Ghanaian colleagues come to Nigeria, they say we work extra late. Anytime I also went to Ghana, I noticed that by five o'clock, ninety nine point nine percent of them are closed. So we may begin to perceive Ghanaians as laid back. Meanwhile, they may be perceiving us as what's wrong with these people? Don't they have a family or a life? I just use that as an example of societal. Um, value. So look at the third component here, human resource management policy choices, employee influence, human resource flow, reward systems, work systems. Then look at the outcomes, HR outcomes. When you are strategic, everything you are doing, you must tie towards outcomes. Whether you are doing TGIF, you must tie towards outcomes. You are doing HMO, you must tie it towards outcomes. You are saying, let us do hybrid or remote work. You must tie it towards outcomes. That say, oh, management, let us increase the salary of certain category of staff or for all staff. Outcomes. This model identifies four key outcomes. Commitment. Competence. Congress. And Congress can also mean alignment. Then cost effectiveness. Then it now goes on towards long-term consequence. And the three key long-term consequences include a three-dimensional. The first angle here is the what? Individual well-being, the employee's well-being. Then organizational effectiveness. And last but not the least, societal or social well-being. So pause again. Look at the your HR plan for 2024 for this year. Did you do proper stakeholder analysis? Are their interests well taken care of? Then I move to the extreme. Can have you identified the long-term consequences of all your programs and initiatives? How will it affect and benefit the individuals? How will it translate into organizational effectiveness? How will it translate to societal well-being? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the best model. I would like you to draw in the chat box whatever has you know, struck you. Maybe it can just be one thing, a word or a phrase. Okay, what have you learned from this first model? Um, what, what struck you? What struck your consciousness? Or what did it remind you of? Or what... Is it drawing your attention to? Ladies and gentlemen, please drop your thoughts in the chat box. Now, I will move on to the second model. The name of the second model is the best model of HRM. HRM means human resource management. The name of the model is what? Yes. You can see the diagram of the guest model. We'll come back in a bit to, to the diagram. Okay. Let me see. I think I have one or two messages. Thank you so much, Omaomi Oladeli. She says here that I have learned that it is important to analyze your stakeholders before bringing or drafting any policy or program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, to the guest model. So we'll come back to the charts, but let's look at the narration very briefly. The guest model was developed in the late 80s and early 90s by David Guest, who is a professor at King's Business School in the UK. The model positions that strategic role, now look at that word, strategic, strategic role of HR and differentiate strategic human resource management from traditional 
personnel management activities. Are we together? So it is one of the first models to incorporate both the hard and the soft perspective of human resource management. The model also positions the impact on business performance. Look at that. This model is what highlighting, emphasizing business performance and acknowledge the vital role that organizational behavior. So look at the keywords here now. One, we have the art and we have the soft perspective of HRM. Sometimes, some of us, sometimes, we only focus on either the hard or on the soft. Again, sometimes we don't focus sufficiently on the business performance. Now, directly or indirectly, whatever initiatives we are bringing to the table as HR professionals will have business performance. But when you take this to the management for consideration, for deliberation, they are first and foremost looking at the business performance. We too must ensure that we integrate our programs, our policies, our approach to highlight the business performance. Again, this model highlights the vital role of organizational behavior and the impact it plays in achieving performance outcomes. So performance is an outcome, but behaviors lead to performance. The guest model describes HR in terms of six interrelated dimensions of analysis that aligns with specific business strategy. Now look at this. Your organization has strategies. There are business objectives, business goals. Whatever you are doing in HR must connect, must have line of visibility towards the specific business strategy. Now, the six premises are first, HR starts with particular strategy that aligns with business intent. Ladies and gentlemen, as an HR professional, you must pick the language of the business. The business wants profit. The business wants revenue. The business wants to grow market share and so on and so forth. The business wants to ensure regulatory compliance. So as you are dropping your initiative, you are adding the business intent immediately. Or let me even help you better. You first drop the business intent and say, I had that. So in order to achieve this business intent, we need to do this HR initiative. You are locking in management. You are locking in the business sentiment. That's the first of the six. The second one, it informs the practices and policies of HRM. So the starting point is the business intent. Then we transit to our practices and our policies. Then three, it results in specific human resource management outcomes. You can see here, again, just to put us on notice, you will see certain overlaps in some of these models, and it is good. And that's why you don't need all the models. You need one or two at most at time, per situation, okay? So the HRM outcomes lead towards desired employee behaviors, such as commitment, and motivation that collectively does what leads us to number five. So the employee behaviors, which include commitment and motivation, will now lead to what? Performance outcomes. At the end of the day, the performance outcomes must also lead to something. They lead to what? Financial outcomes. Which means that at the end of the day, everything we are doing in HR, at the end of the lane, will either lead to increase in revenue, profitability, or reduction in cost, or a combination of the two. Like I mentioned, I will take us back to the figure, to the image that shows the framework or the model. But just before I continue and wrap up with the guest model, I'm going back to the chat box to see some of what our colleagues on this particular session have dropped. Adeleke now says, speaking with respect to the Harvard model, that I've learned that every HR program you are implementing must translate into 
an outcome. Beautiful, beautiful. Omar Obey, as so he says, I don't know if it is my phone, but I can't hear anything. I put it to you that it is your phone. Please log out and log back in. You will get a better outcome. Thank you so much. So let me pause here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll just uh, pause here so that I can check out the feedback I am I am getting. So wrapping up with the with the guest model, again at the upper echelon is what the strategies. And there are different six components. The first component is the, the strategy or strategic intent of the organization. That strategic intent will feed into what HR practices, some of which include hiring. So it will determine the kind of talent, the quality, how much you are willing to pay, and so on and so forth. The kind of trainings, learning and development intervention that we need to put in place. The kind of compensation, rewards, approach, strategy we need to put in place. And the way we will engage and relate with the employees. All these practices will lead to what? Outcomes. Examples of these outcomes will include employee commitment. Okay. When you say employees are putting um, discretionary efforts, they are going the extra mile to get results, to get the job done, to deliver value for our clients and, um, and customers, as, it, as, as the case may be. Some of the HR outcomes will also include quality, value, quality. Some of the outcomes will also include flexibility. In other words, we can make the required adjustments in order to get results and deliver maximum optimal satisfaction to our clients and third party beneficiaries, our stakeholders. Again, these outcomes will now lead to what? Behavior. So what kind of behaviors will drive these outcomes? Motivation, okay? Cooperation, organizational citizenships. Now, because we want outcomes, we need to be motivated. Motivation, we have what we call intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic means innate. That is not necessarily affected by, by, by money or salary. For example, you want somebody who is who likes something to do it, somebody who is passionate about something, somebody who is fascinated about something. Okay, not everybody can be a teacher. There are certain kind of motivation you need to be a primary school teacher. There are also certain kind of motivation you need to have to be a secondary school teacher or a doctor. And for every job, you just don't want somebody who wants to take your job just because they didn't find another job. You are like an option. You are like a third consideration. You are not a number one. You are not a priority. Then cooperation will also include collaboration. You can't get these results without collaboration. Last but not the least, organizational citizenship. What's organizational citizenship? I'll give you an example. Okay, I'll say it in English, but I'm literally translating Yoruba to English. It will have been sweeter in Yoruba, but I'm mindful of the multicultural audience that we, we have here. Now, you know, some people will tell you that is it your father's business? Ladies and gentlemen, until your employees, your colleagues at work, take their jobs like their father's business, then you have not achieved organizational citizenship. Organizational citizenship includes ownership. So if we are not this, this is not eye service. We want to die there. We want the organization to succeed. We want the organization to prosper. So just like you are patriotic that, oh, I'm an American, I'm a Nigerian, I'm a Brazilian. You say, I work with, I work for. You are proud to wear the badge and you will defend that brand. You will fight for that brand. You will be able to make sacrifices for that brand because you also know that brand to what will fight for you. Then you now have performance outcomes. Some of these outcomes include productivity, innovation, quality. These are the what? Positive outcomes. Productivity. 
results, innovation, doing things in new ways, you know, trying to get better results in different ways, trying to do things faster, trying to get things done cheaper, trying to get things done more, you know, in a, in, in a more reasonable way, more appealing to the customers, clients, and end users. And then the quality. Now, what are examples of negative performance outcomes, which are not desirable, which we don't want? You don't want low productivity. You don't want absenteeism. You also don't want turnover. But these are outcomes. So imagine, as an HR professional, practitioner, you list out all the things you are doing, and then you begin to tie them to the outcomes. So if you are experiencing excessive absenteeism or lateness in your organization, there are outcomes. What is triggering those outcomes? What practices are triggering those outcomes? So that if you can isolate them, identify them, then you can now remediate them. You can nip them in the bud, as the case may be. But we want only positive outcomes. Okay? Now, these outcomes, especially the positive one, obviously, will now lead to what? Financial outcomes, which include profits, revenue, return on investment. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the brief around the guest model. Just like I said for the Harvard model, I also like to hear if anything resonated with you, if you caught something specific with this guest model, please drop it in the chat box. I would like to know what jumped at you from, from this model. What value specifically can you draw or pick from this guest model? If you are still also want to drop something inside with respect to the Harvard model, feel free to drop it. Meanwhile, I'm checking here your contributions to this discussion, this conversation. Silola Adebusola Akimbo Wale says here, is it strategic for HR to manage staff costs, manage payroll, and advice on general compensation? I would say yes, it is. Because the, all those payroll, all those compensation will directly or indirectly impact on employee productivity, employee motivation. If you underpay people, for example, it will lead to what? Negative outcomes. It will lead to low productivity. It will lead to absenteeism. It will lead to turnover. Okay, so it is strategic. Let me also quickly say here that what is what does it mean for something to be strategic? Something is only strategic if it creates an, what do you call it? A competitive advantage for your organization. Something is strategic if you move your company a step further. If you move your profitability up, if you move your company from point A to point B, with point B a higher level of performance or a higher level of your organizational growth. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see here. My brother and friend, Ibrahim Ali, you says here, I always tell my colleague that yes, it is not their father's business or their own business. They should take ownership and yes, exactly. That you are trying to encourage them, motivate them, persuade them to embrace the concept of organizational citizen. Okay, my brother and friend there, Ibrahim Mubarak, says organizational citizenship can't be achieved if the if an employee has the mindset of it is not my father's business. Exactly. However, most people from day one they don't just distance themselves from the organization. They don't just say, oh, Ogata, Ogata, Uala, Ruakwe. It is the kind of induction, the kind of rapport, the kind of energy, vibes, existing staff give new ones. The line managers give their subordinates. Peers give each other. And how management, top management and HR, okay? It is how we manage the, 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 the organization, okay? That really leads into, over time, over time, leads into organizational citizenship. Thank you so much, my brother, Ebenezer and Nogu. I see your message. Thank you so much. Hey, my sister, Adebu Sola Akimpo Wale, here says, most times financial department to manage, yeah, it, it, that it depends on organization. Who does it may not really matter, but if finance does it and it's not done well, 
HR will take the, the fall, the play, because HR is ultimately responsible for employee welfare and well-being and for employee productivity. All right. Okay. So we move on to the third model that we'll be checking tonight. So intentionally, I didn't want to just use only models some of us may not be familiar with. So I intentionally said, let me put a model that almost all of us, okay, will be aware. But just let me do a, a, a tiny check. If this is your first time of hearing of David Orich, just say yes in the chat box, okay? I just want to check because I have a feeling that almost everybody, but just let me also do a check. In case this today, tonight, this evening, is your first time of hearing of David Orich, okay? Some people arguably say that Dave Orich is the father of modern HR. Emphasis on modern HR. And, you know, some of us in some organizations who are, oh, HRBP, HRBP, HR business partner. David Orich is like a, a major um, scholar, a major, you know, practitioner that uh, pushed the concepts, the agenda of the HR business partner for. However, he described he, 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 in his transformational model, okay, he categorized the four cardinal tasks of HR into four. One, strategic partner. Two, change agents. Three, administrative experts. Four, employee champion. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. So because of the people who confirm that this is their first time exposure to it, I'll try to be a little more elaborate. Uh, thank you for your uh, vulnerability and your honesty. So ladies and gentlemen, so we'll come back to this image. Let's go quickly to, to the narrative. So the Ulrich or David Ulrich model was pro pro proposed in 1996 in a book, 1996, which is Human Resource Champions. It outlines four key roles that HR function must take on. According to David Ulrich, in that his book, whatever you do as HR, you have four key roles. We look at them one after the other. The first one, you must be an administrative expert. In other words, the way you handle the internal operations by overseeing HR processes and strategies for managing people. So all the day-to-day -day things that we do, all this filing, either physical or electronic, you know, uh, people, all these processes, go on leave, apply for this, apply for that, validate this, uh, go to HMO. They are administrative, but they are important. Ladies and gentlemen, look, no matter how strategic you are, if your administrative competence as a person or as a department or unit of HR, if it sucks, your strategy will amount to nothing. In fact, it's that administrative expert side dimension that brings beauty to your strategy because that is where the execution takes place. Administrative experts. Again, none of this function is more important than the other. In fact, let me bring alignment. You must do all the four concurrently, efficiently. All the four must be running pari pasu, either as the individual HR or as HR as a department. Now, if HR is a department, you may have one or two people focusing on administrative experts, one or two people focusing on employee champion, one or two focusing on change agents, and then one or two, depending on how you allocate responsibility within the HR team. We've spoken briefly about the administrative experts. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have what we call employee champion. Again, this manages workforce work competencies and employee engagement levels to improve what? Productivity. It focuses on maintaining a healthy employee-employer relationship. So if you are unionized, for example, things like industrial relations, employee relations, come into this space, employee champion. You are trying to, you know, the welfare, the well-being of the employees is on the front burner. But what is the intent? Why are you trying to 
fight for their welfare and benefit. It is so that they can increase productivity. Forgive me for this analogy. It's like, why are you feeding the chicken well? So that it will be ready for Christmas. But in this case, you are treating the people well so that they will deliver more. They will deliver more. So you are not just um, treating them well so that you will reduce the revenue of the organization. No, it's for productivity. So each time you increase salary, there must be appropriate commensurate corresponding increment in productivity. So when you are trying to make a case for improved welfareism, the case you're actually making is a case for improved productivity. It, the welfareism is a channel, is a process, is, is, is a means to an end. Third, change agents. Ladies and gentlemen, you must work with managers and employees to launch initiatives that enhance employ company culture and advance the business. You see, from time to time, as businesses, as organizations, we need to make adjustments. Things are changing globally. Things are changing nationally. Uh, economic situation is changing. We have the dollar uh, and the corresponding impact, our manufacturing process, uh, competition, local and foreign. All these external changes will affect and necessitate internal changes. HR has a role to play, like a midwife, to ensure that we pick these changes ahead. We even initiate some of these changes. We provide training, we provide support, we provide soft landing, and we manage the change management process so that the change does not make people throw them off balance, does not make them become disenchanted, does not make them lose motivation. Are we together? Last but not the least, strategic partner, strategic business partner. The fourth cardinal point, and according to David Orwich, is that HR strategies must what align with the company business goals, must create the best method for developing and managing the workforce to best support organizational success. Ladies and gentlemen, so let's go back to the chart so that we see the model. Thank you so much, Ibrahim Ali. Ibrahim says here that yesterday, just yesterday, I used this model in an interview and the outcome was what? Awesome. In other words, when they ask you a question in an interview, especially an HR interview, a management interview, and they say, how would you undo this, this, this? In your head, you are partitioning the answer into four. What are you going to do from a strategic partner perspective? What are you going to do from an employee champion perspective? What are you going to do from an administrative expert perspective? What are you going to do from a change management perspective? By the time you provide all these solutions, the panelists will say, this person has provided a robust, a comprehensive response. We can trust his, his, his judgment. But somebody who is not thinking with a model, who is not using a framework, will probably provide one or two answers. In their hearts, in their mind, they will be happy. They will think they have done a thorough job. Meanwhile, they are suboptimal at best. I'm also still checking our comment box here. Adebu Sola Akimbo Ali says, most organizations are advocating lean HR personnel practices. What is your take on this? Again, it depends on the organizational strategy. There are some organizational strategy that lean will make happen. But there are also some organizational strategy that lean cannot make it happen. I'll give you an example. Maybe you're, you work in a bank and you have 20 branches. And in the next one year, you want to have 300 branches. You, maybe in a branch, you have 20 staff. If you move from 20 branch to 300 branch, as you increase your staff strength, Maybe for every 150 or 120 staff you add, you may need to add one new HR staff. So the number of HR personnel or professional you have on your team is not just what you wish or what you like. You want the adequate number of HR staff, not just the number now, with the adequate required experience to deliver on the business objective. So if you need three, it's fine. If you need six, it's fine. Otherwise, if you need six and you put three, you are going to wear out the three people so, and it will force them to move to another organization as soon as possible, especially 
if if they they are good. Okay. Um, if your workforce is 60, I put it to you that one person may be sufficient. So if you have two, that is okay, in, in my opinion. Ebenezer Anago says, David Orich is my best HR model, HR wearing for caps. Um, my brother, yeah, Dr. Kola Vincent says here, yeah, note, you can outsource or automate some area of the model, such as administrative experts. Very spot on. Again, as a a function as HR function, you may think one or two of these, you may give it to consultants to do for you. At the end of the day, you are still responsible whether you outsource it or you, you, you insource it. Okay. And you also still must provide some level of uh, supervision and quality assurance. And you must also set uh, expectations for the people, um, the organization or the you know consulting firm that you give it to. Please keep all our thoughts, our recommendations come in. I promise to read them out because we are also co-facilitating. My brother and friend, the elected council member, the MIJ, he says, the bigger the organization, the more the number of HR staff that will be required. You can grow big enough to have a shared service model or a specialist model with a center of excellence, and then you have your HR business pack. Again, sometimes too, as organizations grow bigger, they are able to afford technology. For example, enterprises, the resource planning, ERPs. So sometimes you may be 200 and you go to 400. Maybe instead of adding more staff, you now add technology. Or you add technology and one more staff instead of three more staff if you didn't add technology. So I'm just trying to show us that it depends on the situations, the context, and the scenarios. Are, are, are we together? But some type of capital will be employed. So don't forget that human capital is a type of capital. Technology too is a type of uh, capital. But my, my, my guy again, I imagine he's also portraying what I just said here. He said you can also deploy technology to undo good things, but resources will be required. Whether it is human or technology or a combination, as the case may be. All right. Um, Juliet here says you talked about employee intrinsic rewards. Can you explain the other types, perhaps the monetary reward system in line with employee appreciation? So you just mentioned it, my sister Julie. She said monetary system. So salary, okay, the base salary and all the other allowances are financial rewards. So when you have things like um, employee of the month award, you know, you can have a plaque or a certificate and you can add money to it. So you, you can monetize some things or you can give them a benefit in kind. Maybe an all expense paid trip to, to Dubai, to, to Ghana, to Budukatu Ranch. Thank you so much, Ibrahim Aliyu. Long service award. So there are many, 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 many options. So let me attempt to wrap up with respect to this uh, model. Hopefully I can touch one or two models and then we, we call it um, an evening. We take maybe contributions, comments and suggestions and uh, contributions as the case may be. So you see strategic partner here. What are the key things that we do as a strategic HR partner? You develop and align strategies, HR strategies with the business. So which means in column one, what do you put in column one? Your organizational strategy. For example, let me give you a few examples. One can be increased market share. Two can be increased revenue. Three can be increased profitability. Four can be reduced operational costs. One, two, three, four. That is column one. On column two, you now have your HR initiatives. So, for example, if you want to increase market share, HR initiatives can be higher 10 additional sales staff. One, one. One point two. Train existing sales staff to have a better closure on their business calls, 1.3. Follow up on all the existing customers, okay, for repeat business. Trade our staff on client retention. You understand now? So you your initiatives are conceptualized based on the business needs, not the other way around. You see, if you get this communication, this conversation well, you will see that 
your chances as an HR department or as an HR leader of getting a no from your business leader will reduce. Why? Everything you are doing is in the strict sole interest of the business. Even if they will say no, it will be like, wait, or let's reduce this. Not because they don't see the brilliance and the beauty in your idea. You know, there may be some other factors. So develop and align strategies with business. Assist line managers in solving organizational, people, and change-related issues. So, which means you must all, from time to time, engage with your business line managers, your HODs, your head of units. Go and meet them. It doesn't have to be formal conversations all the way. It can be, you know, just walk to their table, two, three minutes, how are you today? What are your current challenges? What are your pressing challenges? Or it can be an offshoot of a performance appraisal cycle. Okay, some of your team members that did not achieve um, exceptional or, you know, reasonable output. What are the key issues? What can we do about it? You, As you are discussing and engaging, then you know the corresponding HR initiatives, programs, and approaches you can use to resolve some of these um, co uh, concerns, okay? Um, again, when you're in management meeting or other meetings, don't just keep quiet and wait till it is time for HR presentation. As every department is presenting, you listen attentively, you ask appropriate questions, you also provide solutions. You ask for clarity. Why are you proposing this particular approach? What other approaches did you consider but you didn't bring to this meeting? That's a strategic business pattern. Okay, foster systems thinking. System means end to end. You are looking at all the all the stakeholders. You are looking at all the players. You are looking at competition. You are looking at the economy. Okay, it's not a silo thinking. Systems thinking. How will this decision impact on one, two, three, four? Okay. You also focus on the customer or the clients. You are also thinking strategically on how to manage your workforce deployment. So those are the cardinal actions and activities under the strategic business partner. You don't have to respond to this. In, the, in this year, let's just focus on this year. From January to date, how effectively have you tied your HR programs, your HR initiatives to strategy? Note, I, I know you are doing HR programs. I know you have concepts, you have initiatives. My challenge to you is how have you tied it? If you don't bring in any new program or initiative, but you if, do better with tying them to strategic initiative, your value and visibility before your management and your employees will shoot up positively. Change management. They understand the organization's world culture. Culture. What is effective and what is what's ineffective? What is working? What is not working? You know, because we have been doing the same thing the same way does not mean it is working. And the longevity does not, you know, provide um, a license for continuity. So longevity can only work if it is adding value. All right? The founding fathers might have started it in a certain way. The context, if the context has changed, the outcomes might have changed. So remember that book, Who Moved Our Cheese? Again, we are not discarding anything because you just want to discard and say, oh, I'm the new kid on the block. It is because you have a good, sound understanding of the organizational culture and what is you can differentiate between what is effective and ineffective. You also want to institutionalize change capability within the what, the organization. Change, we say this is a cliche, but it's a reality. Change is the only constant thing in life. Change is the only constant thing in organization. Change is the only constant thing in business. Change is also the only constant thing in business, in HR. Now, one of the key job of HR is to prepare, position employees for that change. Some will be, as a factor of national or global, economic or industrial or sectoral or even management or board decisions. Whatever the changes, if you can react and respond quickly with the right motivation, we can always capitalize on opportunities and we can also mitigate challenges and even exploit challenges to pilot and pivot the organization to a higher trajectory. You must also, as a change agent, assist line managers to lead and facilitate change. 
You must also act as a consultant, an internal consultant. Look, respected and distinguished colleagues, all HR professionals are consultants. I know there are levels of consultancy. Even if it is at a basic level or intermediate level, you must be able to operate as an internal consultant to all the stakeholders, to all your HODs, to all your team leads, to all the strategic business team. Some of the things consultants, and I know I'm being careful here, I know I have consultants on this call, but some of the things consultants do very well is that they ask questions. They will ask, they, they use models, they will, say, they will use the five whys, they will use templates, and that is why some of these things we are um, you know, discussing tonight will come in handy to enable you um, perform better as an internal consultant in, in, in your organization. Again, as a change agent, last but not the least, today, you must also enhance uh, management and um, management development. Then, employee champion, develop strategies and help implement actions that enhance human capital contribution. That is your employee contributions. Okay? You must help build workforce commitments. You know, people can do things, but there's a willingness and disposition to actually do it. And that's the commitment. You want people to go the extra mile to exercise discretionary efforts. That's commitment. You also want to ensure a fair, ethical, and equitable people process and, and practice. Okay? And then you want to ensure that the voice of employees are heard. So when you do things like uh, town hall meetings, you do things like uh, uh, surveys, uh, poll surveys, you do things like uh, focus group discussions, Sometimes, some of the things the employees will say, truly, you may not be able to do it as an organization. But just because you even listen in the first place is in the right direction. You will now provide feedback. Maybe the actions you will take, some of the things they cannot do, maybe you explain why, provide clarity and context. It treats them like people you will be seen as an employee champion. And of course, if you're a unionized environment, you carry them along as much as possible. Last but not the least, as I recap on the David Orich HR transformational uh, model, you look at the administrative expert, which is create and deliver effective and efficient HR processes and services tailored to unique business needs. Manage people and HR-related costs. You must be ruthless with cost management. Check again, negotiate, review. Do we need this? Can we combine this? Can we recycle this? You must think again, okay? You must ensure internal and external customer focus. So your focus is not, as HR is not just your employees, but the customer of your employees, all right? You must apply information technology, okay? Applications to rapidly deliver quality HR programs and services. Ladies and gentlemen, again, what has dropped in your heart? What do you like? What would you do differently starting from tomorrow? I work with respect to this David Orich transformational model. Hopefully, I can take maybe one more or two more models. Um, I don't want to exceed time. Um, this model is the one week model of human resource management. One week model of human resource management. I will come back again to the image. Let's quickly look at the narration. So. It was developed by researchers Andre and Pedigree from the University of what? Warwick in the early 1980s. So I also want us to see that um, academic and industry is intertwined. The academic grows by what is happening in the industry, and the industry grows by what is happening in the academia. That is why we say there must always be continuous collaboration between town and gap. Okay? All the models, you see that they bring from scholars, and especially abroad, most of these renowned HR scholars that know are actually on boards of corporations like IBM, Google, Microsoft, you know, Unilever, Nestle, and so on and so forth. Some also go and do their sabbatical as practitioners. And we also have practitioners who go and do sabbatical or, you know, research work in the, in the industry. All right, so this model is similar to both the guest and Harvard models, but contributes another perspective on aligning HR practices with external and internal context. So because of time, I will just focus on the contribution. Okay, I won't highlight 
on the similarity. But these are the main elements of the Warwick model. One, it's looking at the outer con context, which includes macroeconomic. Sometimes we call it what? PES2. So political, economic, societal, technological, legal, and environmental factors. How does all of these components and subcomponents impact, affect our HR policy? So this is a major um, differentiator. It speaks and focuses on what? The outer context, the macro environment. So as an HR person, ma, sir, you cannot be ignoring the news. You cannot be saying, what is my concern? You understand? Because everything happening in the policy, in the landscape, affect us. See recently, this uh, um, um, uh, employer, expatriate employee handbook that was released, and the new, will I, I don't, the right word is not a fine, will I say payments or subscription that you need to be paying for expatriate. Thank God for the agitation of the organized private sector and um, the, the employers and HR practitioners. At least for now, the government has placed a stay on that particular policy while consultation and engagement. But if you are not careful, it was going to heavily affect some organizations. Okay? Then, uh, apart from outer context, we have the word inner context. The inner context speaks to organizational culture, the kind of technology that is available and accessible to you, the leadership of your organization. All these factors influence HR policy and practice, and of course, it will be influenced by the outer context. Then we've emphasized this a lot today, the business strategy, I'll just leave it at that. Then the HR content, in, in other words, the role definition of work, HR output based upon the business strategy and influenced by the HRM context. And the HR context itself is the flow of HR work and aspects such as what? Reward system, employee relations, work systems that are influenced by the world business um, strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll quickly go again to the tax, the diagram, and you can see all the elements, the five in total, outer context, we mentioned it, the inner context, you can see the components again, and you can see the HR content here, and then you see the HR um, workflow, then you see the business strategy context here. And the business strategy is talking to about our business objective, our product markets, or our service markets, our strategy, and our context. And you can see the interrelationship between all these uh, dynamics. So I think I'll take maybe just one more, just one more model tonight. And that is the HR value chain model. HR value chain model. This model looks very simple. Let's quickly look at the narrative. Okay, it is based on the work of Powell and Richardson, 1997. So it's a relatively more recent model. Okay, and it creates a nuance in the model regarding how HR operates. So according to the value chain model, it's looking at HRM activities day to day, including recruitment, compensation, training, succession planning, and so on and so forth. Okay, and they are often measured using HR metrics. Now, this model is very conscious of metrics. They are so-called efficiency metrics. For example, the cheaper we hire and the faster we train, the better certain results and activities are gotten. We are also looking at HR outcomes. So we have HR activities, we have HR outcomes. The goal is we try to achieve with the HR activities, we recruit, we train, we compensate to achieve certain goals or outcomes. These outcomes include employee satisfaction, motivation, retention, and presence. If we focus on measuring just, just HR activities, we will automatically prioritize maximizing efficiency to reduce costs. However, this may not produce best long-term results. Instead, we should focus on measuring HR outcomes as this helps to align our processes with our goals. So, for example, we could rather spend a few days longer on hiring a new employee, time to hire an efficiency metric if this person will be a better fit in the company. Quality of hire and outcome metric, we can see. So, time to hire is an efficient 
two metrics. But quality of hire is an outcome metric. The goal should be to get the best person in the right position, not to cut corners and hire someone as cheaply and as quickly as we can. I hope one or two of my colleagues are taking notes. So this model has just three components. Efficiency, effectiveness, and impact. Under efficiency, you have our HR activities and processes. Then under the effectiveness, you have HR outcomes. Examples of HR outcomes include employee engagement, employee retention, employee presence. I'll say those three again. Please pay attention. Employee engagement is an effectiveness thing. Employee retention is an effectiveness thing. Employee presence or absence of absenteeism is an effectiveness thing. Competency level is an effectiveness thing. Performance, the social climate. Then we also have employee involvement is an effectiveness thing. We have trust. So I'm sure for one or two people on this call tonight or who is watching this YouTube video, this may be the first time that you are consciously looking at HR activities and programs from an efficiency and effectiveness perspective. This is one of the values models bring to the table. Okay, look at the things under activities which are under efficiency. Workforce planning, recruitment, comp, industrial, training, mobility, talent, coaching, downsizing, organizational design. They are all beautiful, but they are all what? Efficiency. Look at how you now get it from an effectiveness perspective. Then these two components combined will deliver what? Impacts. What are these impacts? Ladies and gentlemen, profits, market value, market share, turnover, productivity, quality, customer satisfaction. In addition to this, what are some of the other very important impacts? Values, fairness, legitimacy. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to stop here tonight, but let me just recap with my closing, my closing slide. I anticipated that I may have to do a part two, and I'm open at my earliest convenience. I'll do it again. So when selecting a model, what are you looking at? Again, I have said from the very onset of today's session that even though we have been exposed to multiple models, you don't need everything. But you should be aware of all of them so that you will know the one that you need or the two you need to combine per time or per project so that you can optimize your thinking, your thought process, and your activations. Every organization, workforce, and HR team possesses unique characteristics and objectives. When selecting the appropriate HR model for the business, several factors warrant consideration. One, your business strategy. It serves as a foundation for determining the HR model that aligns best with your organizational objective. Two, your organizational design and structure. The size, okay, the design, the structure of your organization can impact the effectiveness of various HR models. The, your industry and the competition, the other players in your industry, the industry dynamics and competitive pressure influence the positioning of HR within your business and shape the human resource management approach. Four, your HR team capabilities. It is essential to assess the skills and resources of your HR team to ensure that they are equipped to effectively implement and support the chosen human resource management model. And just like one or two people have contributed tonight, part of these capabilities could include outsourcing to other consultants or vendors part of these processes. So the capabilities may not be completely exclusively in-house. It can be also with consultants and so on and so forth. But you also need to check, can you afford them? Are they available? Do they have time for you? Last but not the least, Cost effectiveness, okay? Evaluating the cost effectiveness of different HR models is crucial, considering the returns of investment of human resource service in relation to their impact on organizational performance and financial outcomes. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished professionals, incorporating these HR professionals into practice, equip HR professionals with the knowledge, the skills, and tools needed to address contemporary challenges, driving organizational success and enhancing 
employee experience in 2024 and beyond. By leveraging these models, HR practitioners can play a strategic role in shaping the future of work and creating workplaces that are agile, inclusive, and resilient. Ladies and gentlemen, I will stop right here at this beautiful intersection. If you would like to contribute, share, or ask questions, please raise your hands and I will enable you to weigh in this conversation, share your thoughts or opinion or your experience. Let me quickly check the chat box per adventure. There are one or two thoughts that have been shared or expressed that I'm yet to recognize or, or acknowledge. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Says definitely their practice concurrently as daily operations that drives HR towards achieving strategic goals through management of change initiative. Okay. Um, and so he says here, yeah, basically with David's model, I have seen that at one point or the other, HR will function in all four. It does not make one less fantastic. Thank you so much. I can see all the um, appreciation, all the all the people here. And um, Victoria De Barre says, yeah, well done, sir. It is observed that each of these models address different aspects of strategic HR. Exactly. And that is why you can't just say, oh, because last year I used David Orich. That's the only one I want to stick to. That's why we must refresh, you know, check them out. You will see the one that may be most suited at a particular time, point in time. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, my brother Ibrahim Ali. I appreciate you. I love you. Thank you so much. I know Greg Lisa. I appreciate you, my brother. Thank you, Nene. Thank you, Shotayo. Thank you so much, Shiwendi. Ladies and gentlemen, do we have any question tonight around this subject matter? Or do we have any contribution? Thank you so much, Benga John. Thank you, Peter Alua Femini. Thank you so much, um, Mata. Okay, it appears. I can't see any hand up. I hope I'm not um, omitting any name or any hand. All right. Let me just see. Um, are there any you want to say something? Let me, I'm just now checking people randomly. Uh, Pule, do you want to say something? I see Barista called the Tukobi on the call. Pule, I see you on the call. You want to say something? Uh, let me see here. Okay, I think I see a message from Dr. Fala Vincent here. Doctor says here, each of the models helps you to wear different apps. Exactly. Very beautiful, very spot on. A call to creativity and innovation. That is your secret as an HR champion. That is a very well articulated thought. Thank you so much, my sister, Loretta Odoro. I appreciate you, my sister. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to believe this is a convenient intersection to wrap up this conversation tonight. One day in the immediate future, we'll come back with another session on some of these models where we will also shed light. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much and good night.